you had you know all kinds of people. Country uh, like uh, Belarus instituted exchange controls and capital controls. Russia has done pretty much the same thing. We're in the twilight of this terrible time called globalization. Uh, economic globalization goes back to James Baker and George Bush the Elder. Uh, this has been a nightmare. This has been a disaster for humanity. The neoliberal consensus, the, uh, the Washington consensus has tended to rule the world. This is now in the process of collapsing. But then the big question is, what then? And who has the actual program to lead a, a country or uh, larger groups out of the depression? Right? How do you end a depression? How do you defeat a depression? That's the big question. Not, not how much can you complain, how much can you come up with uh, zingers about how bad it is. Everybody knows that. What's the answer? What's the path that leads back to the, uh, the sunlit uplands of economic recovery? Uh, Webster, uh, you mentioned the uh, Federal Reserve here in the United States and how it funds uh, zombie banks, but not the real economy of the country. How is it? I mean, I would think that people would be shocked at this. People think, tend to think of the Federal Reserve at least as partially part of the government. Why would the Federal Reserve be uh, funding zombie banks that should go bankrupt uh, and not our own economy? Well, this is a system that's been around for, for more than 100 years. It really goes back to that extreme right-wing Wall Street Democrat, Grover Cleveland. Maybe we can not go back all the way to that, but it's been around for 100 years since the Federal Reserve Act of, what, 1914, with Woodrow Wilson, who was uh, another uh, Wall Street Democrat. Uh, and the idea is that instead of having a national bank, everybody knew what Alexander Hamilton had done with the first Bank of the United States in 1791. That was simply indispensable for the survival of this country after the Revolutionary War. The British thought that they could uh, destroy U.S. independence. They had a death watch going, as they called it. Uh, but that was in vain because uh, Alexander Hamilton knew what to do in terms of uh, providing credit, defending the U.S. markets against the, the uh, exorbitant power of London. Uh, and then, again, uh, a little bit later, 1817, we have the second bank of the United States, this one piloted by Henry Clay. And just remember, Abraham Lincoln is the direct disciple of Henry Clay. So two banks of the United States, and what you found is as long as you had the Bank of the United States going, things were going pretty well. But uh, once the Bank of the United States lapsed, as it did during the War of 1812 or around that time, then you began to get disasters. And when the second one lapsed, you had the Panic of 1837, which was uh, a cataclysmic uh, disaster for the country and set everything on the road towards secessionism and civil war, right? We're just going through the 150th anniversary of all that. So by the time you get to the 1890s, you've got J.P. Morgan, and he's, he's essentially the long arm of London and the city of London financial community, and um, they decide that they're going to uh, arrogate to themselves this uh, power which the Constitution puts into the Congress. They say, we're going we're gonna to take that away and set up a... Um, Federal Reserve System, which will be owned by bankers, that is all, all the branches, right, the, the New York Fed, the San Francisco Fed, the Chicago Fed, all this, those are all owned by local bankers, so they're privately owned. But the big question is, who makes the policy, right? The technicalities of ownership are one thing, but the policy is what counts. And the, the, the policies of the Federal Reserve Board come from the secret deliberations of cliques of bankers and everything is done behind the scenes so that when you had the uh, the panic the derivatives panic of 2008 you had uh, the the treasury right under law i guess putting out about 1.5 trillion of bailouts the the so-called tarp troubled asset relief program but at the same time you had the federal reserve opening a line of credit of about 27 trillion trillion dollars or zombie bankers, including prominently foreign zombie bankers. And it, what they had a, a situation where in order to get that money, 0% for as long as you needed it, you had to be a bank or a hedge fund or a dealer in U.S.
securities or a money market fund. It got to be that any financial institution, no matter how predatory, no matter how bankrupt and insolvent, could get a generous loan from the Federal Reserve. But if you were a producer of any kind, right, you name it, uh, you, 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 were, you were shut out. So you were just uh, out of luck when it came to that. So most people simply are, are not aware that this is what's going on. Your ultimate goal would be to, uh, again, to nationalize the Federal Reserve. And that would mean the operations of the Federal Reserve would have to be controlled by a public law passed by the House, passed by the Senate, signed by the President. And it would say the U.S. credit requirements for the next year are X trillion. And this is going to be lent in priority order to production first and uh, scientific research and other beneficial things. Uh, but not to financial speculation or financial services or other predatory activities, because God knows we've had enough of that. So uh, that would be the, the goal. But now, in the meantime, you can take advantage of the very lawlessness of the system. Right? Since the Federal Reserve operates secretly and illegally, well, uh, pressure them politically and force them to start opening up windows. Here, I'll give you some ideas for windows. One would be to open a student loan refinancing window, right? We've got 1.2 trillion, 1.3 trillion of, of high interest student loan debt. Well, let's force the Federal Reserve to open up a window where you bring in your student loans and you're paying six, seven, eight, 10, 12 percent, and they refinance it at zero percent for as long as you need, by 20 years, 30 years. So you can essentially neutralize that and reduce that to a very modest uh, monthly or, or yearly payment or whatever it is. Uh, the other one would be, once again, the infrastructure window. This is the classic Franklin D. Roosevelt New Deal way to, way to handle it. You, um, I would say about $5 trillion would be needed here in the U.S. to get it going. Uh, this is ironic because under quantitative easing, right, this... The, what the Federal Reserve has been doing under Bernanke and now under Yellen is that they uh, offer a support operation, really, for bankrupt toxic derivatives, what they call mortgage-backed securities, collateralized debt obligations. And since those things are bankrupt and nobody wants them, the Federal Reserve buys them to mask, to hide the bankruptcy of the zombie banks. And over the past a uh, couple of years, they, the Federal Reserve has bought up between three trillion and four trillion of toxic, bankrupt, kited derivatives, uh, and that's sitting now on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. It's not good. That money could have gotten you the beginnings of a real recovery, right? Imagine a uh, a maglev railway from New York City to Washington. You get here in one hour. Uh, New York to uh, San Francisco in two or three hours, right? Something, and of course, it, it allows you to avoid the uh, increasingly crowded airspace, right? You're soon going to run up against actual physical barriers in terms of the um, the, the amount of uh, air traffic you can allow per per mile, per square mile, and, and so forth. So all of these things would become possible. Other windows, well, a Main Street window. How about that? Um, you know, Wall Street, Main Street. If you had a, a Main Street window, you could certainly say, well, you know, rural America deserves a break. Um, you can also have a farm window, right, farm credit, uh, to try to revive the family farm, push out the, the great agribusiness monopolies by making very cheap federal credit available to farmers, and so on down the line. Right? You can think of a whole bunch of things. Another one, how about an anti-foreclosure window? Suppose you are struggling to keep your primary residence, and you can't make the payment. How about the Federal Reserve comes in and refinances that at 0% with a, a very long maturity, right, 50 years, say, if you needed it. That way you get to stay in your house and the, the zombie banks don't get to uh, auction off your property. So you can see the, the possibilities of using very cheap, right, if it's not 0%, then close to 0% federal loans, at very long maturities, uh, the possibilities here are, are tremendous, and it's a way to uh, to get things going again. In particular, the younger generation now, the millennials, are being crushed above all by the student uh, debt. 
the, the entire progress of the millennials through life is now overshadowed by this colossal debt burden, which is interfering with uh, things like you know, marriage, children, family formation, um, questions of uh, buying a house, buying a car. In other words, this entire economic mechanism is, is breaking down because of this uh, $1.3 trillion uh, dollar debt burden. Now, you could also argue that since higher education in the United States is essentially training the workforce for corporations, the corporations ought to pay for it. That's, that's certainly a very cogent argument. But right now, the immediate thing we could do is to say, if you've got those student loans and you're paying 8 or 10%, we can bring it down to 0%. That is the very least we can do, and that could be done, once again, with a phone call. Since the Federal Reserve operates outside the law, you don't need to wait for the Congress. Obama, or let's say a real president, could pick up the phone and say, um, Madame Yellen, uh, I'm so happy to hear that you've decided to open a student loan window at the Federal Reserve, that you're going to be giving out unlimited sums of 0% 50-year credit to uh, people who need it, right, whose lives have been put on hold by this atrocious uh, debt burden, by this crazy system of financing higher education. And we're so glad that you've now opened that window so that anybody who has a student loan anywhere in the United States can go to their local bank, get that refinanced, and the, uh, the local banker can then turn to the Federal Reserve and rediscount all those notes and get their money so that the uh, the notes eventually land at the Federal Reserve, and with that, uh, a generation can start moving forward again instead of being crushed. Right. So those are some of the things. Um, it's just a, it's a matter of uh, of greed.